Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left off, Jackson just defeated Banks at the Battle of Winchester. Now the Union decides how to deal with Stonewall in the Valley. Lincoln remained calm after the defeat. However, when General John W. Geary, in charge of a small force on the east side of the Blue Ridge, reported that he was boxed in on three sides by Confederate forces, including 10,000 cavalry, making their way toward him imminently. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton grew increasingly worried and sent word to northern governors to send what they could to defend the capital. This stressful moment passed when Banks finally got word to Washington that he had completed a successful withdrawal. Lincoln and his cabinet could breathe easier. However, the relief of knowing Banks' force was successfully across the river did not stop Lincoln and Stanton from calling for troops to converge on the valley to crush Jackson's army. After a few days rest, Jackson's forces moved north. On May 29th, Jackson and Ewell's forces were concentrated at Halltown, about 12,200 strong, and the 2nd Virginia was at Loudoun Heights near Harpers Ferry. Richard Taylor's 3,000-man brigade occupied Berryville. The 12th Georgia occupied Front Royal, and Ashby's cavalry were spread out guarding Jackson's flanks. 7,000 Union soldiers guarded Harper's Ferry. Banks, now reinforced, numbered around 7,000 at Williamsport. Fremont commanded 14,800 men approaching Jackson's rear from the Allegheny Plateau, and Shields' division numbered around 11,000 troops and were on their way to Front Royal, with Edward Ord's 10,000-man division just behind at Thoroughfare Gap. All the Union forces opposing Jackson's 16,300 men numbered around 52,400. On May 30th, Jackson began pulling his men back from their advanced position. He, along with his aide, Sandy Pendleton, boarded a train to Winchester. As they were riding, a courier rode up to the train and signaled for it to stop. Pendleton took the note from the rider, who turned out to be Jed Hotchkiss, and handed it to Jackson. The general read it, then tore up the note, and went back to sleep in his seat aboard the train as it sped off for Winchester. The message was from the commander of the 12th Georgia. Shields had taken front roll and was advancing toward Strasburg. Stonewall, before boarding the train, had begun to get word from scouts and cavalry that more Union troops were concentrating on his position, attempting to cut him off from the upper valley. Jackson hoped to get all of his troops to Strasburg by the morning of May 31st. Most of Ewell and Jackson's forces made it to the town by that date, but Winder and the Stonewall Brigade were still behind, having the furthest to travel of all the troops. The Union forces, if they had moved quick enough, could have prevented Jackson from concentrating his forces and maybe defeated them in detail. But Shields pushed not much further than Front Roll because his commander, Irvin McDowell, issued no orders to advance. Fremont's troops faced incredible obstacles attempting to cross the mountains in mud sometimes past their ankles. On June 1st, to hold the Federal troops at bay until Winder could join him, Jackson sent Ashby's cavalry out along the roads to the east to check Shields' advance and sent Fulkerson's brigade down the Moorefield Road against Fremont. Concerned that Fremont may pose a bigger threat, he sent Ewell to reinforce Fulkerson along the road. Intense skirmishing occurred between Fulkerson and the lead elements of Fremont's troops. However, the intensity subsided very quickly as Fremont's skirmishers pulled back to the main body. By noon, the Stonewall Brigade made it safely to Strasburg. The quick marches done by both Ewell and Jackson's men gave rise to a popular story. One soldier stated that Jackson was a better leader than Moses. When another soldier asked why that was, he stated it took Moses 40 years to lead the Israelites through the wilderness, while Jackson would have double-quicked them through in three days. Stonewall wasted no time moving the Confederate forces up the valley, with Ashby's cavalry performing a rear-guard action. To the east, Shields proposed a plan to McDowell for him to move south through Page Valley and cut Jackson off from Swift Run Gap. McDowell agreed to the movement and as Jackson's forces moved up the valley, Fremont and Shields chased after him. To slow down the Union forces and prevent them from linking up, Jackson ordered the bridges burned in Page Valley and in front of Fremont's advancing columns. By June 3rd, Fremont was at Mount Jackson, just a few miles from Jackson's lines, but the burning of a bridge brought the Union advance to a halt. The rebels encamped at Newmarket. On June 5th, both Union and Confederate soldiers moved south, Jackson arriving around Harrisonburg. Fremont's troops continued to press the Confederate rear guard and Shields halted his command, being too destitute of food and supplies to go on. 
Furthermore, Shields heard rumors of Longstreet's division approaching his command from Gordonsville and pulled back toward Luray in preparation for a surprise attack, but he left Carroll's brigade to secure the bridge at Port Republic to prevent Jackson from retreating and allow for Shields to get behind Jackson's force. Fremont wanted more support to attack Jackson and requested Banks to join him, but Banks stated that his troops did not have enough supplies to make the march. Angry about the lack of cooperation, Fremont marched into Harrisonburg on June 6th around noon as Jackson's army moved toward Cross Keys in Port Republic. That evening, Colonel Percy Wyndham, an English soldier and adventurer, led a mixture of companies from three regiments against Confederate cavalry guarding the rebel rear and flanks. He ordered a charge, but his men held back, leaving him alone. First Sergeant Holmes Conrad, seeing the lone cavalier, ordered his group of men to charge, but likewise, his men failed to follow. Conrad got the upper hand on Wyndham, and the Englishman surrendered. As he was marched to the Confederate lines, he passed Chatham Wheat, the commander of the famous Wheat's Tigers. They knew one another from their time fighting with Garibaldi in Italy, and the men embraced one another before Wyndham marched off as a prisoner of war. After that altercation, Turner Ashby engaged a conglomeration of Union soldiers, including the 13th Pennsylvania Reserves, known as the Bucktails, with a combination of his own cavalry and infantry supplied by General Ewell. During the fight, a bullet pierced Ashby's right side above the hip and exited under his left arm. He didn't speak at all when he was shot and died very quickly. Jackson mourned the loss of his cavalry commander, who had brought him through the campaign thus far. Colonel Thomas Munford replaced Ashby. To Jackson, the campaign was over. He had forced the Union High Command to deploy more troops to the valley, preventing them from linking up with George McClellan on the peninsula, which was his mission. He planned to leave the valley soon to link up with the rest of the Confederate forces around the capital. Carroll's brigade and the newly dispatched brigade under Tyler approached Jackson's force from the northeast. Likewise, Fremont began to move out from Harrisonburg to confront Jackson. Shields gave Carroll conflicting orders first to burn the bridge and then to defend the bridge crossing the river at Port Republic to block Jackson from escaping. Carroll surprised Jackson's small force at Port Republic on June 8th. Just a handful of men from the 2nd Virginia and some pieces of artillery guarded the town, with many wounded and sick men occupying the buildings. However, Tolliver's brigade encamped just a short distance away. Taking the rebels by surprise, the 1st Virginia Cavalry dashed across the middle ford of the river and entered the town with two artillery pieces. Once in the town, Carroll divided his Virginians with part attacking the 2nd Virginia and the others attempting to guard the bridge. Here in the commotion, Tolliver got his closest regiment formed and advanced against the bridge. Union artillerymen, seeing they were outgunned in the town, resolved to destroy the bridge against Carroll's orders, placing a gun at the mouth of the bridge and firing canister into it, hoping to partly destroy the structure. The 37th Virginia charged onto the bridge, driving the Federals from the town. The 2nd Virginia, likewise, forced the enemy in their front to retreat. Jackson then ordered the rest of Tolliver's brigade interspersed with artillery to position themselves to overlook the river and the Union position. The musketry and artillery shells rained down on the bluecoats and forced Carroll's men to pull back in the direction of Conrad's store. For the moment, the Confederate rear was secure, but at cross keys, Fremont's force advanced on Richard Ewell's division. Ewell occupied the high ground around Mill Creek with around 5,000 men. Fremont outnumbered him two to one, but Fremont believed that the roles were reversed and he was outnumbered. Fremont conformed his brigades to the shape of Ewell's battle line instead of choosing dispositions that would dislodge Ewell from his. Making matters worse, Fremont did not stay close to the action. Unlike Ewell, who remained near the four batteries of artillery, 16 guns in all that watched over the battlefield near the Confederate right center. At 10.30 a.m., both sides' artillery began a duel that would last hours. The first Union movement came when Stahl's brigade moved out before many of the rest of the division had aligned themselves, and Stahl did not coordinate his regiments properly. The 39th New York stayed behind to guard the artillery. The 41st New York and 27th Pennsylvania drifted to the right and stopped, leaving the 8th and 45th New York to proceed against the rebels. Unfortunately for the 8th, the 45th New York stopped early in the advance, leaving the 8th to confront the Confederate line alone. The New Yorkers, most of them German immigrants or of German descent, couldn't see the Georgians and Mississippians who were concealed behind a fence. The rebels allowed the New Yorkers to come within about 40 yards of their position before delivering a horrendous volley into them. Trimble sent the 15th Alabama to hit them in the flank as well. The Germans did not put up a fight 
and began to retreat after that one volley. Out of the 548 men they brought into battle, 43 were killed, 134 were wounded, and 43 were captured. Trimble's men advanced a little ways in the pursuit, but the brigade commander brought them back to the position behind the fence. Trimble then saw an artillery battery not far from his position and determined to capture it, sending the 15th Alabama to engage with the artillerymen and the few infantry guarding them with orders to the Georgians and Mississippians to advance once the Alabamians made contact. The Alabamians withdrew after encountering stiff resistance, but the Mississippians followed orders and attacked when they saw the 15th make contact. The 21st Georgia did not move. The 16th Mississippi engaged with the 27th Pennsylvania and what remained of the 8th New York until the 21st Georgia finally arrived to drive back the Federals, but the artillery eluded capture. Stahl had requested that Bowen's brigade offer him support and Stahl's men fell back on the newly arrived brigade. Trimble took the initiative and was determined to beat back the Federal left flank. He called up the 13th and 25th Virginia commanded by Colonel James A. Walker on loan from Elsie's brigade and dashed north along the road with the 15th Alabama to their left. Trimble ordered Walker to keep his men to the right of Evers Farm and put pressure on that location. A Federal battery supported by Boland's brigade occupied that location and delivered some scary shots at the 13th Virginia. They deployed into battle line and began exchanging volleys with Federals, but something odd occurred on the field. Brigadier General Lewis Blinker, the division commander for Boland, Colts, and Stahl, arrived near the Evers Farm. He ordered the artillery battery to withdraw against his brigade commander's orders to remain. This confused the other Union regiments who withdrew with the cannons. The 54th New York remained for a little longer near the Evers Farm, but Trimble brought the 21st Georgia and the 16th Mississippi to add weight to his numbers, which forced the New Yorkers to fall back with the rest of their brigade. Trimble then waited for Ewell's orders, but the battle was over in that section of the battlefield. During this entire fight, the artillery belched forth their iron projectiles, many of them finding their mark. General Elsie, riding in front of the Confederate lines during the duel, became wounded when a shell fragment hit his horse, opening a gash in his leg in the process. General Stewart got hit with shrapnel in the chest, lodging in his back. He had to be carried from the field. Captain Campbell Brown, the future son-in-law of General Ewell, was bringing messages back and forth when a piece of shrapnel hit him in the shoulder, stunning the young man but leaving him relatively unhurt. Nevertheless, Yule ordered him to Port Republic for medical attention. Along the way, Brown met Jackson who was coming to the front. After a brief discussion of what was happening in Yule's front, Jackson accompanied Brown to Port Republic. Jackson and Yule never came into contact that day, demonstrating the confidence Stonewall had in the division commander. Jackson did bring reinforcements with him in former Richard Taylor's brigade, who would take the field soon. Brigadier General Milroy grew impatient with Fremont's lack of aggression. It was mid-afternoon when he, without orders, moved his brigade toward the rise on the opposite side of Mill Creek, occupied by Ewell's men. An abrupt encounter with some Virginia skirmishers posted in advance of the rebel line forced him to move further to the west where he was partially protected from rebel artillery. The tenacious Milroy engaged with the Confederates across Mill Creek. The General's prized horse Jasper went down with two bullet wounds forcing Milroy to leave the animal for dead on the field. Milroy looked after his brigade on foot. After the battle, he claimed that he could have stayed engaged against the rebels for a month if he needed to, as he hoped to turn the enemy's flank, but an unfortunate order arrived from Fremont. Milroy was to fall back, but grudgingly he did as he was told. As he did so, he saw Shank's brigade standing idle. That brigade did little more than make it to the field. It did advance a short distance and engage briefly with Confederate skirmishers, but with only four killed, eight wounded, and four missing during the whole engagement, that demonstrates he did not push as far forward as his report says. Fremont would pull all of his brigades across the Kieseltown Road and give his men a rest. The battle was small but significant. Ewell lost 288 men, 42 killed, 230 wounded, and 15 missing. Fremont lost 684 total. 114 killed, 443 wounded, and 127 missing. Now that Ewell had neutralized the threat to the west, Jackson could turn his attention to the smaller force to the east.